My name is Rich Hogue. I am a volunteer naturalist at Saxon Bog. The people on the Zoom, if you can't hear me, let me know. Same thing for the room. Uh, anyhow, uh, I live about 45 miles from the bog on the northern edge of Duluth. And the last time I was in the bog was actually Monday night. Um, I love it up there. I, um, it's changed. I've been volunteering there about the last 10 years. It's changed 10 years ago. Our one bed, one bedroom, we didn't have a bedroom. Our one room cabin could only get up to about high 40s. And the outhouse wasn't very fancy that we had to use. We now have a uh, extra building and we've got a really neat uh, outhouse. And I will actually show you a picture of the outhouse tonight. So anyhow, am I not? Okay, thank you, Carl. Uh, ah, I never clicked share. Thank you. This is why you bring your children who know more than you. <laughs> Um, so anyhow, I've got like four basic parts of the program, uh, resources, um, make sure I get this right, birding logistics in the bog, geographic regions, and then I believe it's actually target birds. So first thing is, do you need a guide? There's sort of two, and, and oh, the outline I'm working off of is a Google Docs uh, document. All the links, it's on my website. We'll make sure it gets out to everybody. So it will link to various content on my blog. So you don't need to, you can take notes if you want to, but the point is after the fact, you can just get to everything. So this has gone to a web page on the Friends of Saxon blog website. And there's about four or five guides. I could heartily recommend any of them. The key thing to know as far as guides is that if you're gonna go up there for two or three days, if you uh, retain a guide, yeah, I was gonna say that will There. The guides, share information. And more importantly, if you were up there for three days and you used a guide the first day, I think pretty much all the guides do this. They are really tuned into what's happening. So on day two or three, even though they're not guiding you, you'll be part of a little text group. And I'll show you other ways to learn what's going on in the bog. But often if somebody sees a uh, great gray, they're probably gonna post about that after they've been watching it for 25 minutes or so, whereas the guides will post immediately because it's going to people that have been their customer. So that's one of the fringe benefits of the guides. And the other thing is I know they will take you to more than just Sac Sim uh, if they've learned that there are you know, various uh, birds. Now, let's see, I got to figure out. Um, and if Carl can help me, I want to minimize this. Yeah, maybe if I just do that, no. Yeah, I want to go back. Uh, I guess I'll do it this way, but I'm going to end up getting probably so many tabs open. But anyhow, we'll deal with that later. <laughs> the next thing, and I will pass it around in this room. And actually, is there a way that I, can I move this down? Ah, I figured that out. We will put it on the bottom and then, uh, okay. So anyhow, and then if I minimize this, I think the people, no. Nope, I'm trying to get allow you folks on Zoom to occasionally see me. Um, stop sharing. Okay. Uh, oh, okay, that's fine. You, all right, that, I'm not going to worry about it then. Anyhow, I've got a book here called "The Birder's Guide to Minnesota," 
It's written by Kim Eckert, who was the head naturalist at Hawk Ridge, really knows his stuff. He's got a new version of this book coming out within the month. And I'll pass it around. It goes county by county in Minnesota with maps and explaining some of the habitat. So although Saxon Bog is a really cool place to bird, there's lots of other places, uh, not just in Northern Minnesota, across the state of Minnesota. And you can pre-order this now. I've already bought it myself. Just to, you know, I mean, I, you know it, it's a great book, um, so. All right, I'm not gonna make this a, a session on how to use eBird, but just to know if you've never used eBird, I don't think you have to actually have an account to go to these, but there are three counties that cover Northeastern Minnesota, St. Louis Lake and Cook. It's worth knowing, I've got those linked and you can see you know, the most current checklists that have come up. Um, now, not too many people were birding in northeastern Minnesota this morning because depending upon where you are, there's either six inches of snow or rain happening at home right now. Um, but anyhow, those are there. And then the, if you've never used sightings maps, oops, no, there it was, it worked. So just a second, show point sooner. And... Right, we don't want year round. We'll take, um, uh, it doesn't, I will take year round. I'm a little bit challenged because we had to make the screen a little bit smaller, but the point is if I do that, um, and then you can see, I was gonna make it just November and it would have shown that now there's been a couple of sightings in the Ashland area. But if you've never used this before, um, you can just highlight this and type a different bird species and get the current speed, you know, sightings for that. The one thing I will note is that uh, two of the bird species that people are most interested in the bog, the great gray owl and the northern hawk owl are sensitive species, and you won't ever see those listed by eBird. There's Facebook groups for the area if you have a Facebook account. And then just want to show you two maps. Um, first one is Northern Minnesota. And uh, so basically, you see Saxon Bog down at the cent center bottom of the screen. But Northern Minnesota has a ton of bog boreal forest habitat. And what I have here are some of my favorite spots. Um, the Greenwood Forest Fire. We had a huge forest fire in Northern Minnesota last summer, the beginning of the fall. We're now about a year since that. There's a 21 mile long dirt road that they used as a fire break. The fire never actually got there but this dirt road, you have essentially a never ending meadow now that goes for 21 miles. And it's about 100 to 150 yards large. That's, that's unheard of in a forest. And believe me, animals or birds are, are using it now. I spend a lot of time up there. Uh, when I'm talking about these roads, the one thing you don't know at this time of year is these dirt roads, other mostly in the bog, they're forest roads. So whether they will be plowed this winter, I have no idea. It depends on whether there's logging operations going on. And just be aware if there's logging operations going on, if you come face to face with a big logging truck, guess who's gonna have to back up three or four miles to get to some spot? Uh, and I guarantee it's not the logging truck. The, the drivers are really courteous, but uh, seriously, However, it is worth knowing if you do go to Northern Minnesota, generally the loggers don't work on Sundays. And um, so if I know there's a, a road that's plowed but narrow, that's a great time to hit it. 
Pine Island State Forest, which is probably about 125 miles northwest of the bog, Saxon has actually bog land, which makes Saxon look like an also ran. It, it's just phenomenal habitat. Okay. This presentation is not about those, but I wanted you to know they're there. But then more importantly, I've got this map and then right underneath, there's a link to my website, which will take you to more information about each of those sites. And then if you click on any of those links, it'll take you to a blog post that describes it. It may have GPS points that I've saved to a public site. Uh, so just know that there's information to help you even more. Now, Sac Zim, I better than that. I sort of consider it three sections, and you've got northwest, right underneath where it says talking DuPage and Burning Club. There's actually the label north, but you can't see it right there, and then south. And this is coming up from Duluth. Uh, the airport in Duluth is about 30 minutes from right here. And the Welcome Center is right over here. You don't move around fast in the wintertime. You know, we're talking dirt roads and uh, you don't need all wheel drive or four wheel drive on the roads in the bog. But if you hit one of the turns at 25 miles an hour on a slippery day, let's just put it this way. Uh, the law of physics says you won't make that turn and uh, you will be in the ditch. And there is a towing company that is actually shown uh, on here, Mrs. Max, and they have, you know, they're handling Northeastern Minnesota. So it may be a while. Um, at the same time, there are, there's this text group. You, you may have heard of Telegram. A lot of people have started hearing about it because of there's Telegram groups for the war in Ukraine. Um, there's all kinds of other people that are using Telegram as a secure messaging service. And if I fire this up, You can use Telegram on an Apple device. You can use it on an Android device. You can use it on a PC. I'm actually gonna scroll back to some time. There generally isn't much activity after March, but if you remember that map I showed you, to get like from the Welcome Center up to Admiral or McDavid, and I'll go back to the map and show you. That's a 30 minute drive. And if road conditions are poor, it's gonna be longer than that. So if somebody posts that they're seeing a great gray owl and you have never seen a great gray owl, it does not make sense to drive up there right away because even though owls tend to hang out for a while while they're hunting, the likelihood that they might hang out for 40 minutes. Remember I told you most time people don't post immediately when they're seeing something because if they found it, they want to watch it a bit by themselves first. So anyhow, the way to use Telegram is prior to going to the bog or even just the day before, a lot of the birds are a lot like a person going fishing. If they're successful in an area, they'll keep coming back to that favorite spot. And they will continue to hunt, even from the same trees, for a week or two. And then they won't move a lot, but they'll move some. So anyhow, what I tend to use Telegram for is a research tool to figure out target areas that I want to go to the next day or two days hence. And so, 
and you will get in Telegram people posting and saying, you know, there's a great grain owl here, there's a northern hawk owl, uh, there's tons of evening growth speaks. But uh, unlike eBird, where a person might eBird a great gray owl, it would never you'd never be able to see it in Telegram. You can. So just to go back to the map. So this is sort of uh, what sort of like Grand Central Station to use a term. This is Admiral and McDavid. Um, and in fact, uh, a lot of people think of Friends of Saxon Bog as a birding organization. And certainly we have a lot of them, but it's really a con conservation organization. Uh, in the last year, we bought just hundreds of thousands of acres. And just like I was hearing some of the stuff you're doing here locally for conservation, if you don't have mature forests, you're not going to have some of the animals and birds that are associated with that if it gets logged out. And I'm not saying anything against loggers. We've actually got loggers in Northern Minnesota who are very responsible, but still the mature uh, forests that we need, like for a great gray owl, you know, there's a very limited number of that. But from the South section to up here, like I said, is about a half hour. So I generally using Telegram and eBird, I'll pick an area that I really want to focus on. And that's what I'll do, arriving a little bit before sunrise. Second. Okay. Don't try, you know, I understand you want to try and find a great grade. Don't on one day, one morning try and do the south part of the bog, the north, the northwest. You just, there, but one thing worth knowing, it's only in the last couple of days that we've started to have, it's been like here today, a really warm fall, which is delayed. And it was a cold spring. We had snow on the ground to almost the first of May. So the owls didn't nest until quite a bit later. So everything's way behind is what I'm saying. Most years, I'm seeing great grays, the juveniles hunting by actually mid-October or even earlier than that. And it's only in the last uh, couple of days, week or so, that we've started having reports. Uh, I've seen one great gray during the day now. And normally by this time of year, uh, I'm seeing quite a few. But we do know from the end of last winter there, there are two here that we assume were a couple, two on Admiral, two down by the uh, Welcome Center, two over here by Yoki, and there's probably a whole heck of a lot more, but we, we know those owls were an item. And so hopefully they had breeding success. You know, a lot of things, you know, weather, the vole population, but we should uh, be seeing them soon. And uh, websites, I'm not gonna go to any of those websites, but I was talking about Friends of Saxon Bog, that's the organization that I'm a volunteer for and has uh, Sparky listed here as the director. This is his website, but uh, he's just done a phenomenal job with his folks. My own website, uh, some accounts I have. One thing I will at least let you know is uh, uh, my wife and one of my uh, sons are here. We live, at least Molly and I do, Carl is now in Milwaukee, but we live at the very north and edge of Duluth. And I've been privileged for the last four years, now five, to follow a family of great horned owls. And um, through a happenstance, I was contacted by a woman who's a professor and an expert in early childhood development. Long story short, she got me involved with writing children's books. We've done a couple of beginner, beginning readers books that she did all the text for. But I have, and they're free PDF downloads, but it's factually correct. And the first couple, four or five months of the pandemic, I had lots of time like everybody else. And thankfully, these owls live right near my house. 
And as Molly will tell you, I'd be over there four or five times a day. Uh, and so that book takes you through their life from when actually before they were born through being uh, owlets to finally juveniles or so, you know. I mentioned outhouses. Now you may think this is a strange thing to have as part of the presentation. And it is, but there's a couple of things. I think most of you have heard of a famous museum in France called the Louvre. And sorry if my French isn't that good. This is the Louvre. <laughs> and Sparky came up with that term, not me. And so, but first you can see it's nice and clean. But secondly, it's an art gallery. How many outhouses do you know are art galleries at the same time? So we invite you to bird when you come to the blog, but we invite you to enjoy our local color. But more importantly than that is that, let me go back to the map. And this is a great time to talk about um, finding stuff in the bog. All right. This was the Welcome Center where I'm moving around. There's an outhouse there. There's a boardwalk right here. There's an outhouse there. I think those are really the only two reliable. Oh, and then there's one way over here at Mary Lou's. These are about a half an hour more from each other. And the only restaurant is over here at Highway 53. That, that, there's an indoor bathroom there. I mean, we, we have luxury in northern Minnesota. Um, but all joking aside, when I'm birding in the bog, uh, by late morning, if I'm birding with some friends and I'm, I often go home because it's close. But if a friend is up from like the Twin Cities and wants to stay longer, well, there's the Wilbur Cafe over here. And we'll, we'll get there like about 11 o'clock because it, it's the only show in town as far as a restaurant. Uh, you know, plenty of people bring sandwiches and things like that. But if it's fairly cold and we talk about the 43 below, it's sort of nice to be inside for a little while. Um, there is a gas station right opposite there where it also has a bathroom. But uh, seriously, you can get your great gas station food. And uh, actually, I do that a lot. My uh, family makes fun of me. I like roller dogs. They have roller dogs there. So anyhow, there, th this is forest. When you go from here to there, you, there will not be a single home. There are homes and farms scattered throughout the bog. Um, just be respectful. The people that live in this area, generally, they love being out in the countryside. So if you've got a big camera with a big lens, don't point it at their house. Also respect their private property uh, and then you'll just have a real nice time. But th these are people that are generally highly independent. Um, so go back here, just a second. Close, all right. Now pe people online, are looking at the photograph, but I brought the real McCoy here. And uh, when it's 43 below out, you know, it's uh, everybody in the family, our family cross country skis, but when you're cross country skiing, you're moving and generating heat. That's not the case when you're birding generally. So these are genuine skier mucklucks. Um, Will Steger is an Arctic and Antarctic explorer. Uh, he's got a shop in Ely, Minnesota. The thing that's really important about these, other than they're warm, is these leather straps wrap around the uh, canvas that comes up my uh, leg. And for the people online, I'm talking about those boots down there. And let me move 
the screen a bit. So those boots there, that's real important. You don't need snowshoes in the bog. I do occasionally go cross country skiing, but when you walk the boardwalks or there's just a lot of paths that have been, you know, sort of smashed down by lots of birders, you'll be watching a bird, you'll see a black backed woodpecker and you'll take one step to the left. Well, while you're on the path, it's like walking on a sidewalk on cement. When you take one step to the left, you may suddenly be in three and a half feet of snow and it'll come up to there. Now, one, you falling it is no big deal because it's really soft snow, but the snow, if you don't have something like that, you could have gators, so you don't need uh, mucklucks. The snow will get into your boots and you get back in a car with the heater going, uh, that's gonna melt. And if you're wearing cotton, which incidentally is really dumb, you should have wool socks on. Um, so you want something, if you're gonna be doing a little bit of hiking, invest in some gaiters or something to prevent snow from going into your roof. And my son is chuckling a bit. I think he's thinking about a uh, first, it's cool, my two boys, did a winter trip from Ely to the Gunflint Trail, and that's by the Boundary Water, so it's all self-propelled via um, uh, snowshoe and speed. And they had an interesting experience with snow in the boots, if I remember correctly. So we won't go into it any more than that. So the other thing is I got a pair of duck boots here. There's nothing sacred about duck boots, but Mine have a really thick sole. That's worth knowing because when you're just standing there in the cold, the cold comes up through the ground quickly. Uh, I have trail shoes that I use a lot during the year, but never in the winter. And then I wear uh, two sets of wool socks. I have a lightweight pair of wool socks and then a real heavy. So keep your feet warm. You'll keep yourself happy. And then hands. So I think a lot of people take photographs, but even at 20 degrees, your hands will get cold real, real quickly. I'm not saying that this is the only way to fly. But this is a, these are smart wool gloves. So, so they're good gloves. They're not cheap gloves, but you know, if I'm shoveling, my hands stay somewhat warm, but if I'm standing there with a camera, they don't. So when I'm going hiking in Northern Minnesota, we affectionately call these choppers, but they're mittens, big honking mittens. And so then when I get to a spot where I wanna photograph, I, I take these off. I don't take, I very rarely take the gloves off if it's fairly cold. Um, so that's another thing. Mittens, um, well, the last thing I will show that way is thinking about the weather. Um, if I go back to the map, Let me close there. Good. All right. Highway 7, which is right there, is noted for having great grays. And if you're starting early in the morning, the forest is fairly far off the road. So if it's not cloudy, you can see the silhouette of birds even 20 minutes you know, before uh, sunrise. If you're on Admiral and McDavitt, where the trees come to within a couple of yards of the road, 20 minutes before sunrise, you can't see anything. So a couple of things. If it's windy, you probably aren't going to want to be out on Highway 7. So I actually plan some of my birding that way. Or just in terms of sunrise, I go look in Highway 7 first because I know I have a fighting chance 
20 minutes before sunrise of spotting something, but two things. This is a genuine American Birkebeiner headscarf, and you don't need a genuine American Birkebeiner headscarf, but the thing, and Carl, if you wanna take a picture of this for the family, cause I saw you taking other pictures, say, it's gonna go to my other kids. Do you know what dad is doing? And you know, so at any rate, the important thing about this is it could be a scarf. If there is wind, and when we were talking the temperature I've been burning in, that, that wasn't talking wind chill. This really, really helps keeping your neck warm. It's a lot easier. If you go to any ski shop or place outdoors, they probably, they're not expensive. And then I'm actually well known throughout the bog for this. This is, this is camouflage. Owls look at this and they don't know what I am. And, uh, but everybody knows that Rich is the guy that wears a Norwegian stocking cap. The other thing I do, and if we go back to the picture, let me find it just a second. For the benefit, okay. So layer. So I, I'm wearing obviously long, not today, long underwear. Um, but then I have a thermal shirt, a thermal long underwear top. This is a thermal shirt, a wool sweater. My parka is actually a two-part parka. So in the car, I can wear this. The other thing is from this time of year on, I've got my extra car keys in here. And even if you have a car that has the combination lock, I've got a couple of friends that have those cars and they've started doing it because when it, they've had some issues on occasionally, sometimes when things are really cold, cars don't work the way they should. And so I really advocate if you're up in the bog uh, in cold weather, have a set of keys on you because if you get out of the car and it somehow gets locked, you know, so then I've got the other parka that goes over the top. Now, what I do, if you're into photography, so you're burning from the car. This is uh, northern Minnesota, north of two harbors. It's not actually the bog, but. I actually drive with the windows down, not all the way down. And I also turn the heat way down. Now that may sound counterintuitive, but the heat escaping from your car or also your hood, it can shimmer. And if you're trying to get a focus lock on a bird, it really makes it difficult. Now, then if you get out, um, you know, just walk away from your car and don't slam the door. I'll go into this in a bit, but great grays hunt by hearing. And they'll probably put up with you walking sometimes within 15, 20 yards of them. But if you slam the door, they'll just react and leave. I mean, it, you know, um, so. You will run into crowds like this. And this was the, this is a picture not taken by me, but by, from the Friends website. This is the Admiral Road feeders. About two years ago, we had a boreal owl that hung out for about two weeks. And it was smart. We just hang out, hang out by the feeder and eventually a bull is gonna run underneath. And there's, it's called a bird feeder for, more than one reason. But even on Highway 7 or McDavitt or Admiral, it isn't unusual to have a crowd. Last year, I knew there was a crowd on Saxim, or not Saxim, up on Highway 7. Meanwhile, 10 miles away, 
I watched a great gray by myself for close to a half hour through sunset. And this is a picture I took, you know, the sun has gone down. It is very possible throughout Northeastern Minnesota and the bog to have a private experience. Most people will focus upon uh, the area. Let me go back to the map. Most people will focus upon this area, which is understandable, but there are times where, you know, there are great grays down by the Welcome Center up here on Yoki. That's why also I like to use Telegram and, you know, find out other things because I like to have a much more private experience. Then the other thing is I just go bird areas outside of the bog, some of those ones that I told, uh, told you about and have linked here. Um, Go back down here, crowds, no crowds. We talked about photography speed, oh yeah. And I'm not talking heroin. <laughs> uh, you don't wanna go over much more than 10 miles an hour. And the reason for that is a Northern Hawk Owl will hang out right on the top of a tree. A great gray will not. And so they really blend in. And let me just go show you. And actually, I think sorry, I should turn that off some. Uh, where is it? Hold on, hold on. There it is. Ah. So Actually, it was a different picture I wanted to show, but I want to show that too. So sorry when there's too many things. Gray. There. So that is a great gray and a white cedar tree. And if you're going at 20 miles an hour, it's, and if it's 20, 30 yards off the road, you're probably not going to see that out. And there are, they blend in and just look at the coloration and the white cedar. And uh, I happened to see it land in that tree and immediately said, oh, this is a cool, it is just so nicely camouflaged. So let's go back to habitat. That's what, it, and this is also about gray to gray. So if your trip to Northern Minnesota allows check the weather in advance. And so here you can see it was earlier this week, there was an eight mile an hour wind with 23 mile an hour wind gusts. That's a really lousy time. I'm gonna turn off my phone, uh, hold on. And I'll turn it off, I just need it. Twenty-five mile an hour wind gusts are not a good time to be looking for something that hunts by hearing. They can't hear, it, so there can be two, three, four, depending upon the time of year, feet of snow on the ground, and the voles are running underneath the surface of the snow. So I took this picture. This would actually be showing these vectors in real time. Uh, any wind that's coming out of the west northwest is generally cold. Uh, if I'm up there, I'll look at not just the temperature, but what the wind gusts are doing. And this is just, you know, there's this weather app. There's nothing, you know, special about this app. Um, lots of apps will show you wind speed. It's worth paying attention to. Um, if you happen to be planning a trip, I realize it's eight nine hours from here to drive to the bog. But if you look at the weather forecast and it's gonna be ugly in Northern Minnesota for the next three or four days with high winds, cancel your trip, seriously. But what I do wanna show you, and this is what I mean, this is, I watched this owl, well, you can't see the owl, but I want, you will see the owl. I watched the owl catch a vole. And that 
is the impact area. There's the wings. And that's about two or three inches of snow, crusty. And then there's a layer of about two or three inches that was open. And then there's more snow. So somehow the owl's ears are offset. So it doesn't know it's using trigonometry, but it is. And this is the owl that actually made that catch. And I'll show another picture of an owl. So at this point, it can feel it. And then it is, there's the vole right there. It's just plunged its head underneath the snow to uh, pick it up. Come on, scroll for me. Well, don't worry, we'll get to it. I may have to go back and bring it up again in a second. I know it's at the top. Breeding habitat, here it is. So we'll do it again. There it is. And anyhow, want to show one more time. Sorry about having to scroll down, but I don't seem to be able to minus all the way back. What I do want to show you is a different owl. This, so if you ever see a photograph of an owl with a bull running across the snow with talons outstretched, the reason people say that that is a baited owl is one, voles don't. I can't say absolutely never ever, but I am comfortable saying 99% of the time plus they don't, you know, they eat um, uh, bulrushes. Uh, that's not bulrushes, uh, anyhow. Yes, thank you. Um, and they're getting all that vegetation stuff under the snow. And so what this owl is doing, I am going to maximize this. That is the instant that it is plunging its talons and legs into the snow. That's the way they hunt. So how someone could have a camera lined up to have you know an owl outstretched. I was standing about 40 yards from this hall, and I, I didn't have a clue, as, you know, because I can't hear anything uh, running underneath the snow, but it can. And that's why I say be quiet, because as long as you're quiet, they're generally pretty good, almost tame, which is the wrong word to say with a wild animal. But still. Go back down, okay. All right, we talked about not getting stuck. Mrs. Max Towing is in here. In, in the bog, the one thing I will say, although you don't need four wheel or all wheel drive, in Northern Minnesota, the dirt roads, the uh, plow, St. Louis County, Lake County, they plow wider than the road is. And so it looks like the road is about three feet wider on each side than it actually is. So first you do wanna pull over to the far side of the road because you wanna let locals be able to drive by. But if you pull over too far, your car is gonna tip and you're good and stuck. So just be aware that uh, you wanna get out of people's way but you don't want to pull too far over, which is very counterintuitive. Uh, but in the bog, you don't need four-wheel drive. And actually, if you make that mistake, generally four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive isn't going to help you out anyhow. Um, we showed other maps. The one thing I do want to show in addition, and I'm linking off there, if you've never used Google Maps offline, I have annotated instructions on my web. It's linked here. You can all get to it. 
So the GPS chip on your phone will always work, even if you don't have a connection. Therefore, if you're driving a back road, a dirt road, and you come to a intersection, goes left, goes right, you can tell which way you want to go by just looking at the map. And that's really, really neat. Uh, I have used that many a time and, uh, you know, in the Spirit National Forest, Chippewa National Forest. It's actually good here in the Chicago area too. Not that you don't have uh, good, hopefully good cell phone coverage, but if you download maps to your phone, it will make it that much quicker when you're driving around because you can just interface with your phone rather than actually having in your new area. So uh, my son Carl lives in Milwaukee. I have Milwaukee downloaded. Um, I have a son that lives in Seattle. I have a daughter that lives in Minneapolis. All those metropolitan areas are downloaded. So Google Maps offline, it's a great tool. Lodging, um, depending upon So there's four basic areas. Let me go back to the map. Uh, a second. There we go. So if you want to stay in the bog, right down here, there's Alesha's, uh, and it's typed out. I've got it on there. It's it's not a bed and breakfast, but it's a beautiful farm. It's an inn, and they have a central um, kitchen. It's not it's just a beautiful little place. You can prepare your own foods, um, cook your own meals. Uh, they don't do breakfast for you, so like I said, it's not a B and B. And they know birders want to be up and going early anyhow. But it's a great place if you want to maximize your time. And we, as I noted, there aren't really any restaurants around. Then, if you go up or down Highway 53, from right about here, this is the four lane highway, the Iron Range, which would be Virginia Hibbing, where the iron ore is mined, is about 15 to 20 minutes north. And so, you know, there's a nice super eight up there. And if you stay up there, you maximize your time in the bog. If you go south from Cotton, where that little restaurant is, about 30 minutes, that gets you down to the Duluth Airport area, which is where this is going to sound strange when you live in Chicago, but we talk about that's where the mall is. You know, we, we talk about the highway. Everybody knows what you're talking about because it's generally never more than one uh, in an area. So, but it, the point is there's your standard hotels that are up there with, you know, chain restaurants and whatnot. Now, if you have somebody in the family who doesn't bird, the Canal Park area in Duluth, which is about an hour and 15 minutes from the bog, is just gorgeous. It's got some really nice hotels. You're looking out right on Lake Superior. You've got the aerial lift bridge through January 23rd or so. You have uh, the shipping season going on and uh, your non-birders could just stay in that area for the day. Or when you, you know, in the winter, uh, pretty soon we're gonna have sunset, you know, around 4.15 and if it's a cloudy day, it's gonna be dark earlier than that. Um, so you get there and, you know, if you want to go to a nice area, a nice restaurant. So point is the options are right in the bog, Alesha's want to be close to the bog and just a standard, but clean hotel. That's a little bit North or about a half hour South into the Duluth airport area, or for the non birders that are part of the family, then I really suggest the uh, Canal Park area. Just be aware that Canal Park is very popular with folks from the Twin Cities and all over the Midwest. And so if you're gonna be there on a weekend, particularly 
make your reservations in advance because it's a lot more than birders that uh, want to stay in that area. Uh, we talked about phone service. We talked about uh, geographic regions. Once again, I have, um, if I follow this link and we did earlier, it lists these. I also have a GPS points that uh, will give you, uh, you know, driving spots to start and stop some of these. So we talked about the North Bog. Um, The, the boardwalks, um, they're generally around about a half mile long, and it's needed it takes you deep into the bog. Uh, just be careful, they can be slippery. You have snow on top of wood, and uh, particularly if you're going when there's been, you know, into February, and there may have been a day where the temperature with the sun, you can get melting when it's a little bit when it's like 50, 50 um, 25, 26 degrees out if it's sunny you know, in February, the sun's higher up. Um, but what I tend to do is I look for owls first thing in the morning, and then I'll often pick a bog that has a boardwalk, and I'll do that second. And what I'm looking for then are woodpeckers. And so just to show you. So for instance, a blackback woodpecker, blackback woodpecker, which a lot of people like to see, you'd never see in feeder because they don't eat suet. And they certainly, some woodpeckers will take uh, sunflower seeds like red belly woodpeckers will store them for the winter. I've got one visiting my feeders right now that's storing up with that. But a hairy or a downy woodpecker, they tend to drill. I mean, you know, just constant. A black back woodpecker or an American three-toed woodpecker, they're flaking bark off. And so they'll go tap, 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 and stop. And then they both flake it off so they're not drilling. And then they look around to inspect for bugs. And so, what I do is I walk on my, the reason I go after looking for owls, it's generally less wind in the morning. And the way I find blackbacks in American tree toad is by hearing. And I'll start out on the boardwalk. And guess what? The, the woodpeckers don't just hang by the boardwalk, you know. And so, but you'll see paths going through the woods. What you want to look for, if you can see in this photograph how the bark sort of looks cedarish, reddish. If you can find trees that have lots of bark at the base that's sort of red, as opposed to getting brownish, brownish means they haven't been working that tree recently. Reddish means it's fresh bark that's been flaked off. And it generally means woodpeckers are in the area. The way you can tell a blackback versus a American three-toed, they look a lot alike. They both have that yellow, but the three-toed, which is rarer, will have that sort of uh, cross white pattern on its back. So the other, um, one that everybody likes to talk about well, too, but first, as far as owls, boreal owls. So this actually is the owl that was hanging out at the Admiral Road feeders. Um, but boreals don't tend to come down to Northern Minnesota until mid to late January, even if it's an eruption year. Uh, hawk owls will arrive around Thanksgiving. The first uh, snowies, the first wave will be like the first week of uh, December. But just so you know, we won't know whether this is going to be an eruption year for boreals till well into January. And occasionally get them in the bog, but you're much more likely to see them along the North Shore of Lake Superior. They probably got pushed by the wind. 
and now they're migrating down the shore and they tend to hang out in balsams near little streams because uh, they don't hunt you know up high in a tree you may not think great grays hunt high but comparatively boreals will hunt down below the tree branches and so anyhow they but the when i say the easiest time to see them it's not easy but on a cold day you can drive the uh, scenic um, 61 just north of Duluth. And if it is a wind out of the Northwest, the trees on the upper side of the road, and for us, that means the side away from the lake because there's always a hill, so it's always uphill. Um, anyhow, they'll be hanging, tucked back into the, uh, the balsams and spruce, but still open to the sun. They're trying to get that thermal warming. Anyhow, we'll know mid to late January. Um, and if you've never seen one of our boardwalks, this is a nice one. And you'll see paths going on. When I'm going to pass around now, it's really cool. One of the boardwalks, the land was donated by a local family. And unfortunately, they had a little, uh, I think he was four years old, died of cancer. And his grandpa has been uh, car carving these owls. And I'll just start them around. And they're at the, um, He, he gives them away for free. There's like a big uh, cooler there. There's a uh, guest book, which he asks you to, uh, you know, just say a few kind words. And it's called Augie's Boardwalk. And it's the way that the family is making this little boy uh, live on. And it's just a neat experience. And quite frankly, it's the most phenomenal souvenir you can get from the ball. And there is a little donation uh, box, you know, leave a couple of dollars or something like that. Not a big thing, but um, it's a special part of the bog and uh, the family is just really nice. So targeted species, the, um, People want to see sharp-tailed grouse. There is a lek where they dance, but the numbers have not been that good the last year or two. But generally they dance first thing in the morning and the lek is a little bit about a mile south of the welcome center, mile and a half. Spruce grouse, even though the bog is a, a boreal forest, I own, in the last 10 years, I only know of one spruce grouse sighting. And it was a friend, he actually got a photograph. Um, if you want spruce grouse, go to my other location, which is the Greenwood Forest Fire Stony Lake Road. I saw 17 spruce grouse on Stony Lake uh, a week ago Saturday. You aren't gonna see black bear. Uh, we start filling the feeders right after Thanksgiving when we think Yogi's asleep. Um, the mo time most likely to see any of these are first thing in the morning or a little bit before sunrise because that's when they tend to be most active. Um, Pine Martin. It is a neat looking animal. I don't have a good photograph, uh, but the Admiral Road feeders, people put off peanut butter and the Pine Martin loves peanut butter. And on a cold day, you want to go sit over there, and a lot of people do. Uh, they'll wait for an hour, hour and a half to see a pine martin. So the Admiral Road feeders, and the other thing is boreal chickadees like peanut butter. Boreal chickadees do not eat sunflower seeds. So if you bring a little bit of peanut butter for the Admiral Road feeders, uh, you both you might see a pine martin, and then 
this is a boreal chickadee. Most people know the black cat. Um, the other place that's really, matter of fact, I prefer to see boreal chickadee is at the Welcome Center, right behind the um, outhouse. There is a path that's called Gray J Way. It's about a half mile long. It's totally flat. And at the end of the half mile or so, there's a really nice little grove of balsams with like two suet feeders and two uh, sunflower seed. The boreal chickadees are extremely reliable showing up there. There's two or three that come in regularly. And if you're out there for 15 minutes, you're probably gonna see them a couple of times and from a distance of only eight feet. You know, the other thing I find is that particular spot, like last winter, there were pine grosbeaks and gray jays and other birds using it. And the birds that were at the Welcome Center, you know, they put up with you being 30, 40 yards away. When you were at the end of Gray Jay Way, you know, six yards. I, I don't know what the difference was, but uh, there are boreal chickadees in other places throughout the bog, but uh, I just, it's a lot easier to find them on Gray Jay Way. Um, Bohemian wax wings. Um, you can find them in the bog, but they're not really a bog bird. They like uh, um, crab apples and mountain ash. So a Bohemian waxwing, one way, first they're bigger than a cedar. They also have these yellow uh, wing bars and tail bars. Uh, but with the telegram group, people will talk about, and including me, I posted uh, when two years ago, and I think, uh, yeah, you folks, uh, right, there was a crab apple farm that I knew about. And normally, if you see 20, 30 bohemian waxwings, you think, wow, I found a flock of 400 that stayed there for about a month. It was amazing. So. I think, let me just put this back and go look at my outline, hold on. Oh yeah, so yeah, no, that's understandable. Well, how do... Maybe a little closer. A little higher. <laughs> a little higher. Ah, <laughs> hello, folks. This is the owl that I had being passed around. Uh, it's actually really neat, and each one is different. Uh, and so, uh, anyhow, matter of fact, here's the okay. other one. So, here's owl number one, owl number two and human number one, so. Uh, let me just take a look through this, hold on. So just reiterating, because I, I, I sort of talked about it, um, sunrise for owls, for great grays particularly, early morning I do woodpeckers. I like to go to the Welcome Center and get there we start our day at 10 o'clock. We don't get there earlier than that because we know you're all out looking for all seriously. But if you get there at 9.30 or 9.15, uh, last year we had a ton of evening grow speaks, a ton of pine grow speaks, obviously gray jays. It's a nicer experience. Um, more people tend to come noon, one o'clock. The other thing, and I don't need to tell you this, but particularly if it's cold, Birds are doing a lot more eating, you know, early in the morning. Um, so I tend to do my finches and grosbeaks from mid-morning to afternoon because 
the woodpeckers and owls I find are harder, a much harder find. Um, and then sunset, you know, if, if it's clear by 40 minutes at this time of year, by 40 minutes before sundown, it's already starting to get dark because by 30 minutes before sundown, the sun is actually below, no, not below the horizon, but the tip of the pine trees, which means it's getting dark uh, if you're on Admiral or McGavitt. If you have found a great grade, the other thing that I often do, if I know there's snowy owls around or some other kind of owl, I'll go look for them uh, at sunset. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've spent 30 minutes with a snowy owl a little bit south of the Welcome Center all by myself because I know everybody's focused on great craze. Now, I understand if you want to see a great craze, but if you've already accomplished that fact, you know, it can be really nice. I did talk about weather, but clouds versus sunshine versus snow. The owls really don't mind snow that much. They don't like wind. Uh, they prefer days that are cloudy just because think about it on a nice bright day with the sun glinting off the snow. And there are, um, you know, they hunt well at night too. So, I like to go out, if this is an option, if you see that it's been really ugly weather in Northern Minnesota for two or three days, and you can then do a trip, uh, that's a great at time, because they haven't successfully hunted and they're hungry. Temperature, um, you know, when it's really cold, they're having to burn more energy to uh, stay alive. So that will cause them to hunt more. Since they don't like snow, excuse me, snow doesn't bother them as long as it's not too heavy. They don't like rain. Owls, one of the reasons they can fly and not make any noise is, you know, other birds have the oil that they use for uh, pruning, not pruning, pretty. Um, they would want to prune. Um, anyhow, so, but because of that, it, if, if it is drizzling fairly hard, because you know it can happen in the winter, it's not common, but anyhow, rainy days aren't good. And then wind. I guess that's it. Once again, uh, this information, this. Uh, Google Docs sheet, which links to everything, whatever the website is or whatnot. Uh, it is on my own blog, a number of places, and uh, maybe you can send it out to your membership. And so I'll just keep it up there. There's no reason for me to take it down. Um, and in fact, uh, while I was down here, I had another Audubon Society actually in southwestern Minnesota ask if I could present via Zoom. So uh, I'm going to be using this for them with a slightly different focus. Uh, questions um, either from, how do you do this? Do you generally do Zoom or audience? Yeah, folks, uh, we'll do start here and then just tell them how we do for a second. Yeah. All right. So if you're, if you have a question on Zoom, type it into the chat and the moderator here will pass it along to me. And are there any other, are there questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, it, yeah, you've already seen some down here. We're seeing them there. It appears to be an eruption year. Uh, we uh, There's three places where I expect there to be a lot of evening gross peaks up in the bog. One is the Welcome Center itself. Two is the Sisu Feeders, uh, which is called the Zabin. Uh, on your map, that's in the north side on McDavitt, uh, right near the crossover. It's an A-frame uh, uh, cabin. They always have evening growth. Then Mary Lou's. Mary Lou's is extreme northwest side of the bog. 
she's the person who had the, if you know about, had a garage burned down last year. She must have 50 bird feeders. She's got a uh, photographer's blind. She's got off street parking. She has an outhouse. Um, she takes care of people. She's, she's a phenomenal lady. Uh, the only thing I say is if you're there, just don't point your camera across the road at the people that were there. But yeah, there's there, there are going to be a lot of evening gross weeks this year. There, yeah. Oh, at the yeah, that one person. It's. Yeah, the question was about landowners, and there was a person that you needed to stay uh, well away from his property. Uh, the individual, I, we're pretty sure, well, I'm certain, it is a veteran with some post-traumatic stress syndrome. Anyhow, uh, it's on the map. Just don't bird near his place. And we haven't had any problems with him recently. Uh, I think he's mellowing out a little bit, but uh, he's had a tough life. So, um, and it is, it's, um, as you come across on Arkell, not Arkell, uh, on Saks Road, as you turn to go down towards the Welcome Center, that turn, uh, his place is off to the right. And other than that, I've never heard of a landowner that has hassled anyone, uh, you know, people that, if, there's been a few birders who have been on private land and deserved to be yelled at, to be told to get off land, but still they weren't, they weren't set upon or anything like that. But that person is still there. Yes. Thank you, guys. It's probably about 20 years ago, there was a major eruption of uh, rain. That was about 20 years ago, and I wasn't pr present for it. Uh, I keep hoping. Yeah, um, everybody tells me about that particular year. I think it was 2005, six, seven in that area. But, you know, people tell me some of the areas that I'm birding, they could go see 20 great grays and, and it was crazy. Um, and I, I think it may have been often people think that it's a um, lack of food that causes these. And it's often the opposite. There's been an explosion of voles. And it's the same way with snowies. Snowies, you know, move around the Arctic. And when they find a population of voles, just the population explodes. Um, so there really haven't been good population studies done of great gray owls, but what just was done last year, and in fact, uh, I know the young woman, she's a master's uh, degree student at the University of Minnesota, really cool, bunch of us uh, were uh, donors, and we put, uh, well, she put uh, the little transmitters, solar array powered on Northern Hawk Owls, because we didn't know, are they nesting in Northern Minnesota? And if, you know, they're three or four miles away from the road, they might as well be a hundred miles away from the road in the summertime. And so we're just getting the data back on that one. And it turns out that most of our Northern Hawk Owls are going up to the Northern reaches of Lake Winnipeg. And I just saw her out birding about a week ago. And I said, so, since I knew she had all the data, have they started south? <laughs> and she's told me no. <laughs> so, but yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I'd love to see that sort of data like they're doing with Project Snowstorm for Great Grays. Are there any questions on this? Um, first of all, somebody recommended the restaurant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, they do have all day breakfast. I like their omelets. And Aiken County, I think somebody said it was a good place also nearby. Um, or at least it was. It was. Okay, the question was they said that Aiken County, which is um, probably 
oh, 40 miles south of Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and then goes over towards Highway 2. It certainly has great grays. Um, I would spend more time in the areas that I have shown, especially because over the last 15, 20 years, 30 years, the boreal, unfortunately, the boreal forest is moving north. And Aiken, that was always the extreme southern end of edge of the boreal forest. So I'm not going to say you can't find them there, though. Um, somebody asked about the snowies in particular. Um, does find on farms? Um, during December, uh, so you, yeah, the question was where can you find snowies in the bog or elsewhere? And first, you're not you're not going to find them in the forested areas because they hunt by sight rather than by hearing, and so they want a field of view. Now they could be sitting on a balsam and the edge of the forest as long as there is an open field that they can see. And I, I've seen that, but generally the snowies are the ones where I've seen them the most are from the Meadowlands, which is south of the Welcome Center, south, which is farmland. But having said that, the last two years, there's been a snowy on Highway 7 near where the Great Grays are seen in Burns Greenhouse. Um, if you really want to have a snowy owl experience, what I'd recommend it, First, people will talk about it on Telegram and they'll tell you exactly where it's roosting during the day. And often there's a chance the snowy may hunt during the middle of the day. But if you go to my website where it talks about Northeastern Minnesota burning locations, Superior, Wisconsin, which is right across the harbor from Duluth, it's a hotbed for snowies in the wintertime. And they they may be on a telephone pole, but it's just as likely over there. They might be on a balsam or pine tree, and you can, uh, you know, there's a good chance you can be within 30 or 40 yards of one. I'm lucky enough that a good buddy is friends with the Superior Police, and I'm allowed to go out onto the Superior Airport. I'm not allowed onto the runways, but I can go on the taxiways and stuff like that. But I'm very careful because I don't want to lose that privilege. And that shows you you're in a smaller area because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do that in a major city, you know. Um, so, yes. Yeah, let me pull up the map just to, the question is who owns Saxon Bog? The answer is, whole bunch of people. And I'm not being flippant, but that really is the answer. Let me maps. So this is Highway 53. The bog is generally considered, this is one. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, sure, yep. And then, okay. So, this is Highway 53 coming from either the Range or Duluth. This is Highway 133, it's a paved road. And then up here is Zim Road, which is a paved road. So this is sort of what's considered Saxon Bog. Now, the owls, the evening grosbeaks, the boreal chickadees, they don't understand that humans make maps. That's, you know, it's where habitat is. And in fact, if you go over here more to the Northwest, if you go here to the East, there is plenty of bog habitat. But to get specifically into your question, between Highway 7 and 53 is a land bank. There is actually a private corporation that bought all that land. And over the last four or five years, they've done a lot of great work. Um, people actually tried to farm the bog and it was advertised to Europeans in the early 1900s after it got logged out some. And it was a horrible place to log, but because of that, these ditches messed up how water drained and things like that. So this company spent that money 
and it's, it's a really good bog wetlands habitat. And then they sell those wetland credits to like a corporation down here in the Chicago area who has wetlands near where they're trying to develop. And that's what a wetlands bank does. So anyhow, although this is not privately held, it is based upon the current laws of the United States can never be developed. And actually to develop it, given what they've done would be really impossible. We just purchased the Friends of Saxon Bog, pretty much all this uh, orangey yellow area. That is mature forest with dead heads and whatnot. It's beautiful, beautiful uh, forest. The area just to the west of McDavid, we hopefully will have enough money to purchase that shortly. We've also purchased a lot of land near the Welcome Center. Um, and then there's a lot of public land that's owned by county and state in the bog. So when you come along here on um, Stacks Road to go up there, that's state land. And it says it's managed by the DNR for sharp uh, tail grouse. I've never seen sharp tail grouse there in 10 years. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, yeah, still, there, there's areas like that. So in answer to your question, it depends. There is a, if you ever want to know prior to a trip, I know that there's an app that hunters use to figure out private land. And it's actually, a guy last night told me that now you can actually, based upon your GPS location, um, will tell you whether that next step you're gonna take is on the private land. There's also one of you Google St. Louis County Land Explorer, and that's the county government. And the same thing, you can look at parcels. And I, I use that one. Um, so it's probably about 50-50. Any more questions online? Okay, the question is, do our snowy owls tagged and marked? Up until two years ago, the answer would have been yes. Uh, there was a, a gentleman in Superior, Wisconsin, actually Duluth area, act, he'd done a lot of great research. He had um, studied snowies for 25 to 30 years. He was the head bander at Hawk Ridge, but he did use what we called shoe polish uh, on their heads. So, you know, from a half mile away, you could tell that the snowy had been banded. Uh, he, he's, for various reasons, including health, uh, he's really not doing much anymore. So last winter, I think there was only one snowy out of many, many, many that got uh, banded like that. But the same respect, that gentleman has done some great research. Um, I think if he was younger now, he'd probably get the training that you can get for Project Snowstorm and start going that way. I am the uh, final side because of that. There's two working grain elevators in Duluth, one in Duluth, one in Superior. And I was hiking the forest near my house and somehow I got talking to this guy that was walking his dog and he somehow, and he said, you're the owl, I'm known as the owl guy locally because of my books, kids, anyhow. My, they needed a new person for their grain elevator as their owl guy if an owl gets hurt. So in their uh, lunchroom now, my phone is up and I've actually got experience. I have hand captured two snowy owls in my lifetime. The first time was very scary. Uh, the head, uh, naturalist at Hawk Ridge talked me through the process because I was about 45 uh, miles from Duluth. In fact, this would be a great way to end just a second. Just a sec. Uh, so. You know me. That's silver. Anyhow, I, I was birding hiking along a field and I came around a uh, bend in the trail and there was a snowy staring me from about 20 yards away. And I, I politely took a couple of photographs and then turned around and walked away because 
I didn't want to stress the owl. When I got home, I posted the photographs to a little group I remember, and both a friend and myself noticed there was a little bit of red around one of the wings, and we wondered whether it had been injured. So I went back to the same spot, which was almost an hour drive right before sunset, and it was still there. So I walked really close to it, like about eight yards away, and yelled at the top of my lungs, which normally I would never do. And it, you know, it didn't spook, it didn't fly. And I knew the owl was hurt. And I called the head bander and I said, well, we have a raptor center, you know, rehab center in Duluth. But he said, you're not gonna drive an hour in the dark to come get an owl in the middle of the woods. He said, you're gonna have to hand capture. I said, what? And anyhow, that blue uh, blanket I always keep in the car. And he said, well, if you've got something like that, if you come from the back, put the blanket over the owl, grab the owl, grab it tightly and firmly. You come from the back because talons can only go forward. If you have the um, blanket over the head, it'll probably, probably, I like that term, probably calm down and hold it tight so it can't get you with its beak. So I did that and it, it worked, but then I had to drive home. Now I did not have a cage for a snowy owl in my car, <laughs> which I discovered was a problem. I was birding by myself. I put the wrapped up owl, totally wrapped up in the blanket on the floor of the car in the uh, up front on the passenger side where my wife might normally be seen. And about eight miles into my drive, I look over and the owl is starting to get out of the blanket. <laughs> that is not cool. They talk about distracted driving with cell phones. This was distracted driving. I pull over, I wrap it up real quickly. I had a pair of huge, I don't know, they were in my muck lucks or something. I had some big boots and things. I piled stuff on this owl. I then got to the rehab and they had called the director who came in and he looked at it and he says, well, this owl doesn't look too bad. He says, but we need to do some surgery. He said, we? He said, do you see anybody else around here at 7.30 in the evening? I said, no. He said, well, let's prep. So he, he did the real surgery stuff. I became an owl anesthesiologist. And I had a little bag that it breathed in and out. I was taught what to watch. And so uh, I have done many things in my life, including being an owl anesthesiologist. And believe it or not, a month later, I found another owl in the snowy owl in distress. And there were a bunch of people there that time. I said, no problem, I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs>